Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Global Voyage Singapore 2024. I'm Joan, Head of Marketing at Southeast Asia at Wolfers, and it's my honour to be your host for today. We would also like to warmly welcome our distinguished representatives and guests from both within and outside of Singapore. And I have an important job to do today, and that's to keep you informed and awake. In today's World First flagship event, we're going on a half-day journey to learn from industry experts and entrepreneurs who will share with us what it takes to step out into new markets and grow globally. Before we begin, two things to note. First, may I request all our guests to switch our mobile phones to silent mode. And next, throughout the program today, we'll be giving away not one, but 10 lucky draw prizes. So stay tuned for that. Now, without further ado, I would like to invite Daniel Chua, Regional Commercial Manager for Southeast Asia at Wolfers, up on stage as he gives the opening address. Daniel, please. Um, good morning, um, distinguished um, guests, um, partners, customers. Um, welcome to our event. On behalf of World First, uh, I would like to thank you guys for gracing our event and most importantly, you know, supporting us all these years. In World First, uh, we strive to be a good business partner for SMEs. Uh, we continuously strive to be better, a better partner, and we continue to listen to what our customer needs in this ever-changing business landscape. We have listened to our customers and it seems like you know, stepping out or going global has been a recent focus. Hence, we have you know, today's team of stepping out. Um, stepping out generally means you know, going global, but you know, it's definitely not a straight line um, getting out of Singapore or going international. Uh, there are many steps that we can possibly take to achieve this um, goal of yours. Um, it can mean you know, being, going digital, right? Be turning a traditional business to an online business to expand your global reach. It can also mean you know, setting up and hiring talents in different countries. It can also mean you know, rebranding your, your, your company to have a new look and feel to target new markets. And last but not least, have enhanced products and new products to fit different market needs. So for today, you know, we are privileged to have a lineup of you know, industry experts to help you, to give you advice and insights on getting there. Right? So without further ado, let me make our, my first introduction of our first speaker. Um, she, <laughs> yeah, under her, her leadership, you know, World First has ex experienced unprecedented growth over the last few years. Um, the reason we have been able to do well recently because of her mantra of you know, putting customer first, we continue to listen what customer needs and develop products you know, for them. So without further ado, you know, I'd like to introduce our CEO, Clara, to, give, to kick off the session today. And most importantly, let you know what's in store for World First in the coming years, right? and, um, and how we can help you to step out of Singapore. Clara. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Clara. I'm actually based in Singapore, surprisingly, because I mean I relocated to Singapore last November, but uh, rarely based, you know, based in Singapore, but rarely spent time in Singapore yet, because I traveled uh, quite a lot. And actually, you know, uh, this is uh, this year is quite important for us because I mean um, we are all in, you know, international, you know, um, business this year. That is our number one target. So. Uh, you know, um, this is also the reason why I want to, you know, uh, have this uh, product launch. Um, I know many of you actually know us very well, probably from the very beginning, but still, we actually today bring a lot of new products and the features to, um, you know, support our, our, our customers, uh, you know, going globally. So, um, well, first, who we are? 
Actually, WorldFirst today is a one-stop digital payment and financial service platform for cross-border cross SMBs. So um, today, we actually served, you know, over one million merchants with total TPV over, you know, accumulative 200 billion already. And this year is also quite special for us. It's actually 20 year anniversary, you know, of Warfers. It's also 10 year anniversary of, you know, Warfers in Singapore. So um, we are truly global. We have actually, you know, uh, 32 offices in 16 countries. But if we look back, actually, you know, uh, World First from the very beginning actually, you know, started as a, a FX service provider. And today, we are still the leading, you know, uh, FX service provider in this market. If you see, you know, our growth, you know, actually in the previous five years, that growth was phenomenal. If you see 2019 to 2023, our FX volume actually grew by five times. So people would wonder, you know, what happened in 2019? That was actually the marriage. I would call it, uh, you know, happy marriage. <laughs> happened between Warfest and, you know, uh, Ants, you know, International. So um, exactly on the Valentine's Day, so the marriage happened and the Warfest became, you know, a wholly owned subsidiary of Ants, you know, International. And today, we offer a full suite of FX products and, uh, um, you know, spots. We offer 24 times 95, you know, currency pairs. And also, you know, uh, forward, we offer, you know, from three days to uh, two years forward. That is against the margin deposits or against the FX line we granted to our, you know, uh, customers. And most importantly, firm order. This was launched about a year ago. So um, this will, that will greatly help our customers. You know, um, no need to watch out the markets during the holidays or off work hours. So the system would, uh, you know, help you monitor the markets and, uh, you know, conclude the deals at the desired rates you actually, you know, uh, uh, appoint. And also swap. This is quite important, you know, particularly, you know, this year. So we are going to launch, you know, swap to, you know, uh, our customers. Hopefully, you know, before end of this year, um, the top 10, you know, uh, currency, major currency swaps. When we serve our customers, we started as an FX service provider. It's also related to the money transfer or the fund transfer. So we heard many like voices or noises, we notice there are many more pains when our customers doing, you know, global business. So um, the most, you know, common ones will be account. It's so difficult to have a bank account to support the business. Particularly, you know, I, I would give you an example like us, you know, I still remember, you know, um, early 2023, um, and International, as a big client, actually, to one of our partner banks, wanted to have a, uh, you know, Poland, PLN account in Europe. It actually took us, you know, six months and, you know, um, requiring us a lot of documents and, you know, duty process, even though we already are existing customer for them in another market. So, um, account is so difficult. Particularly, you know, when our customers, you know, I call them, you know, mini multinationals, they want to have accounts, say, in US, in Europe, let's say in Latin. Well, nobody knows them. It would be just almost, you know, mission impossible for them to knock at, uh, you know, the local bank store or the international bank store, give me a bank account to support my business in this local market. So that is most painful part. Second is actually, you know, payment, particularly when it comes to cross-border. I don't know where is my payment. I made that payment two days ago. Why my, you know, suppliers hasn't received it? What's wrong? It's totally not visible, the whole process. It's just a lot in the middle, right? And third one is uh, the fee, the hidden fees. <laughs> what is the correspondent fees? What is the credit fees? 
I paid the 100. Why my customer just received, you know, say 50? What happened? Can I just make a full value pay to my suppliers? Those three are very common when we talk to our customers. So the question we ask ourselves is, what more can we do? So this is actually, you know, today's main theme. That is, you know, one word accounts for your global business. So let's say, let's see how it works. Easy, fast, secure, right? That is actually our, you know, say targets, I mean slogan for word accounts. So you will see that uh, I mentioned about how difficult to get account opened. But for word account, it's 100% online. And it could be within a minute, you can get that word account opened. The whole onboarding process is quite smooth. And word account, it's a multi-currency account. We currently cover 24 currencies. And that means you actually can keep all the balances in the 24 currencies and do the conversion upon your needs. And today, what accounts we offer to customers from 200 plus markets, you know, or countries. Collection. As I mentioned, you know, when I do business, we just talk about, you know, I mean, um, you know, the trend post-COVID, you know, say the globalization to localization or to regionalization. So how to bring that global to local? Collection is so important. So last year, our collection currency in the local currency, only 16. Actually, this year up to this moment, we actually expanded to 31 local currency, you know, um, collection accounts or solutions. What does that mean? So you sell goods cross-border, let's say to USA. Within a minute, you actually can apply a US dollar, domestic in US, a US dollar virtual bank account. So your customer will pay you like a pay local customer, local, you know, supplier. And given it is a local US dollar account in US, it is directly linked to that, you know, local clearing system. So that means your customer pays you immediately through that fast payment system, RTP, you will get the money in your local dollar, US dollar collection account. And once that money hits your local collection account, it will be immediately pulled over to be under your word account balance. That is back at, you know, the cross, you know, not cross currents, the cross uh, bought pooling structure fully embedded without like a hassle or kind of noticed by our customers. Then the money, once reflected under your word account balance, the next minute you can make a payment using that balance. Same thing for Europe. You can apply for IBAN. Same thing for MXN. You can get MXN, say Mexico, and same thing, you know, in Southeast Asia. So this is quite important. And we do notice our customer when they expand nowadays more to those emerging markets, not traditional US and, uh, you know, Europe, you know, um, market, now more aggressively to the emerging market. And that collection currency in the local market is so important. So that will be our ongoing target to expand this collection currency coverage um, yeah, more. And also, as I mentioned, the instant. Because, I mean, today, if you look at the world, cross-border fund transfer is still a pain because there is no so-called universal or global real-time, you know, um, uh, payment system, right? <laughs> Even though every country, like Singapore, right, every country has that, uh, we call it RTP, real-time, you know, um, payment system. But how to connect them all. Through word account, through this collection, we actually connect that. So it's uh, multiple, like the local collection, 
but uh, you know, cross-border, you know, uh, pooling, but can't support it by our global fund, you know, platform, that global fund network, and multiple. You probably, you know, particularly for e-com customers, you open stores on Amazon US, you also have stores on Walmart US. You want to two different accounts to manage your business. So this, uh, you know, you actually can apply multiple local currency collection accounts through, you know, uh, word, through word first. Payment. On the payment side, today we actually cover 90 plus, you know, currencies to 200 markets, you know. Uh, to me, I think we pretty much cover all. <laughs> so on the payment side. And uh, also today, if you look at our payment, uh, you know, um, volume, 90% of the payments would hit, you know, beneficiaries accounts within T plus zero. Through that indirect indi and uh, all direct, uh, you know, integration with every market, local markets, you know, uh, clearing system. And also it's quite uh, transparent, apparent. I mentioned the pain point, when I make that payment to my you know, suppliers in uh, offshore, let's say far away in Brazil, I don't know when he will receive that. So through that uh, word account, you can easily track where the fund is. So this is a visibility. I mean, it's quite important to, for you to understand, you know, the whole fund flow and the whole, like, uh, you know, efficiency of that, uh, you know, fund movement. Safety. This is quite important in a way that, you know, say, um, for world first, I want to give everyone my word is that we are 100%, you know, compliant and we are 100% safeguarded. What does that mean? Customer fund is entirely safeguarded and, you know, in, in the safeguarding account according to every regulator's requirement in every jurisdiction. And backhand, the safeguarding account actually are supported by our, you know, global, you know, say, uh, partner banks. They are all like, uh, you know, uh, I call it a global strategic important financial institutions. That includes, you know, uh, Citibank, HSBC, you know, JP Morgan, um, you know, Stand Chartered, Sparkless, and, uh, you know, um, all those renowned, you know, say, uh, big, you know, multinational banks, you could name it. And, uh, you know, uh, we are pr very proud of our risk, you know, management, you know, um, say, uh, defense line. Um, our fraud rate is actually less than, you know, uh, 0 0.1, you know, um, basis points. That is, uh, you know, of very abnorm of this, uh, you know, industry. And also zero account uh, theft. With all this, we just want to make sure, you know, we are protected, our customers are protected, our partner banks are also protected. And back end, so all this being regulated, you know, according to, you know, the 60 plus, you know, licenses, you know, in all the markets. That is, you know, I would say payments, you know, onboarding, you know, payment, collection, the features of the world account, but more to come. When I talk to, I mean, I just, uh, yeah, said so that this year, you know, hardly, you know, I'm based in Singapore, but I hardly spend time in Singapore because I traveled so often, you know, uh, except for <laughs> Africa, I haven't been to all the other, you know, continents I've been to, I mean, for the first half of this year. So we do actually hear, you know, more um, like a request and, uh, you know, from our customers. And one of that is actually, you know, card, particularly on the payment side, you know, how we can help our customer to make that uh, their, you know, TNE, make their corporate expense, make their, you know, say, uh, supply, you know, like, you know, payments uh, much easier and, you know, anytime, anywhere. So this is actually card. Card is actually not a new product for us. We launched the VCC, we call it the virtual credit cards, you know, for Hong Kong and, you know, mainland China customers two years ago. And uh, um, I should say that product was not so um, 
yeah, happy <laughs> product for my uh, for our customers. But still, we saw the growth so quick, so fast. Like you know, every year like a triple the car transaction volume. So we actually know that it's so important, you know, for our customers. So this year we upgraded our card, you know, uh, product. We become the issuer so that we can, you know, add more features and add more flexibilities into that product for our customers. And most importantly, for the first time, we actually launched, you know, say, a multi-currency card. So it's no longer just, you know, a dollar card. We actually support 12, you know, currencies by this, uh, you know, uh, card. We also issue, you know, not only virtual, but also physical card. So that's, you know, with the physical card, with the virtual card, also it's a debit card, you know, say a multi-currency that could save, you know, all the hidden costs, you know, in the FX conversion. It will also greatly, you know, expand the use cases of the card usages. So um, cards will be very soon, you know, by end of October, right, will be launched, you know, for our Southeast Asia, you know, uh, customers. And the next one is actually Word app. About a year and a half ago, we actually launched, you know, so-called uh, World First Mini Program in, in China. Because um, China, you know, Alipay, WeChat Pay, super app, right? So people doesn't like, you know, just, uh, you know, so-called downloading, you know, um, like hundreds of apps, everything like, you know, in a super app. So we launched actually mini program. It was so well received. Most of our customer will go to our mini program to initiate the payments as well as to check the pay, you know, um, check, you know, the account statement as well as for the authorization. So um, we, you know, also noticed post COVID, actually our customers' behavior also changed, moving you know to mobile. I believe in next two or three years that will be the trend. So um, for 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 uh, for us, actually this year we launched you know app. This is the first time for us to launch the app right this week. Um, uh, in UK and Europe, you know, uh, first. And so that's, you know, with that app, card issuing, you know, payments and authorization, account statements will be in the, uh, you know, app. So we can actually, you know, um, just make, you know, um, say payments or use, you know, um, word accounts anytime, anywhere. And uh, um, for, um, you know, Southeast Asia market, that will be October time. Uh, app will be, you know, uh, officially launched in this market. And then, you know, um, China, um, mainland China and Hong Kong, as well as Australia. This is so important. We, as I mentioned, you know, Southeast Asia is actually um, the, 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 the farthest, you know, growing market uh, for us in international market. And uh, we quite well established in Singapore market, but Singapore is a hub, you know, for Southeast Asia. And we want to, you know, from Singapore to support all the other customers in Southeast Asia. So um, today we actually offer, I call it the offshore, you know, um, say a world account solution for, you know, all, almost the major markets in Southeast Asia. And uh, um, hopefully very soon, we are going to have our local, you know, world account solution for customers from Malaysia and Thailand. So we are in the middle of, you know, applying for that license, um, you know, uh, with Malaysia, you know, um, regulator. And Thailand, you know, we are working with 2C2P, that is the uh, acquiring arm of anti-international in Southeast Asia uh, region. And uh, Vietnam, we actually launched, uh, you know, say uh, last November. It was actually phenomenal growth, like, you know, um, it's a 10 times, you know, um, like, you know, say a uh, year on year growth. And every month, it is actually historical, um, you know, kind of record. And um, so uh, just stay tuned for all these, you know, markets. And uh, um, I hope, you know, if you go beyond, you know, Singapore to all these markets, World First will be your uh, first, you know, say, um, um, partner to, um, you know, to, 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 to be considered. 
So on top of that word account, you know, uh, we also developed the two solutions. I call it the, uh, industry tailor-made, you know, solutions. One is for um, e-com, the other is actually for B2B. So um, e-com solution. I think uh, better to give an example how you know it works, you know, from our customers, uh, you know, perspective, from the business starts to you know the uh, you know the sourcing part. So let's say Peter is an online seller, and he actually wants to go abroad to the new market. So globally, we actually work, uh, you know, say with you know twenty plus you know e marketplaces. Uh, have that uh, direct integration to help our customer get that green pass or green, you know, um, yeah, green pass for the store opening. So let's say Lazada actually in uh, Southeast Asia, we have the direct integration. So we're first the customers. Once you are our World Account customer, right, I'm fully onboarded, you actually just go to our portal and click, I want to open a store, um, you know, on Lazada. So actually within three days, your store can be opened. We provide that credential, the EKYC, upon your request via our integration with you know, um, the e-marketplaces. So they don't need to spend time to know who you are and to do all the screenings, the scrutinization. We actually provide all those backend, you know, credentials. So that is actually a uh, ready to go product today in this market, three days. And with the integration with most of those, you know, say e-marketplaces, previously a store opening could take you, let's say, one month or up to two months, and today, by average, seven days you could, uh, you know, have that uh, store opened. And globally on the collection side, we actually work with 120 e-marketplaces. All those, you know, say, um, you know, major ones in every market, we get that connection. So use Word account, you can immediately, you know, set up the collection service. So that is actually, you know, um, this local collection is so important. I mean, 24 currencies, we are expanding to more, so that, you know, um, selling globally is more like, you know, sell you know, locally. And uh, particularly for e-com, uh, it's not just one store, it could be multiple stores. So we actually offer that account-to-account uh, -account linkage, entity-to-entity -entity linkage, for you to manage your global business through one platform. So um, this is a quite, uh, you know, very much liked by our customers. And most importantly, on the sourcing part, we do have that integration with the eco partners, with the logistic companies, with the VAT, you know, uh, agents, as well as with those, you know, uh, popular, you know, um, sourcing platforms. So that use, you know, what account worth us, you can make the direct payment to all the, uh, you know, the eco partners and the reconsideration will be done immediately. Particularly, I want to stress out, it's actually sourcing from China. It's, uh, um, you know, 1688, it's a very popular B2B e-marketplace. And I know many like e-com, you know, say, uh, sellers in this region do have that direct sourcing from, you know, 1688. And Warfare is the only one can provide you with the direct pay to 1688. Use your balance in your word account on 1688, you know, checkout page. And very recently, we actually added, you know, um, uh, Taobao, I mean, Tao World, to be, you know, another, you know, say, uh, suppliers of the, uh, yeah, the uh, uh, materials. And cross-border B2B. Let's still take, a, you know, a, 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 a real case. Like, you know, Claire is an offline, you know, uh, seller. He, um, you know, she actually goes to Canton Fair and uh, he actually, you know, agrees to a sale. So for us, we actually, you know, help 
clear to have this uh, E order. So both sites can actually go to um, you know, uh, our portal and uh, you know, place that order, electri electronic order. So you could see all those order information will be here. And uh, once it is drafted, the clear actually can send the order to you know, the buyer and the buyer can you know, confirm. Once actually confirmed, clear, you know, all the payment methods will be here. Then the payments will be decided, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, 100%, you know, payment. If it is 100% payment, then that's, uh, you know, as a down payment. And that payment will be held in escrow account by us. So both buyer and sellers don't need, they don't need to worry about the, uh, you know, say, the possible or potential like disputes or whether I pay the money, you don't ship the document, uh, ship the goods to me. I mean, all those that trust issue could be, you know, easily actually uh, solved. And uh, if you look at uh, payments, we do offer not only just the word account balance pay, we also offer, you know, the uh, card payment uh, of the six major card schemes. And down the road, I mean, in every market where the buyer, you know, is located, we want to add more payment methods for the buyers to pay, you know, um, the suppliers through World Trade. And this is, the, um, you know, it's just like a B2B being fully digitalized, like a B2C. So the shipping documents also can be viewed. And the whole, like, you know, goods, I mean, um, status actually can be transparent and visible to both sides. And the back end, we actually have integration, particularly with all the major logistics companies and custom house in China. So particularly when you do the sourcing from China, if you use the watch trade, actually, you actually can see all the goods, I mean, the shipment uh, status. And back end, it also, you know, we all provide that, uh, you know, say, validation service, right? It's a real logistic, you know, say, uh, um, shipping document. It's actually not a fake one. That also helps to ease off that trust issue between the first-time buyer and the seller. Yeah, once... The buyer confirms receiving the document, uh, receiving the goods, then he actually can confirm the payment. Then up to that, actually the whole deal, I mean, uh, transaction being uh, closed, being uh, concluded. So this is actually a whole uh, World Trade, you know, uh, solution. It, will, it was launched actually in, uh, um, you know, April time. And today we already served, you know, 200 plus, you know, uh, sellers from China, while buyer side is actually, you know, 3,000 from 33 countries. So it's quite, uh, I think, a popular, and this market uh, will think the same, um, you know, particularly for those, you know, uh, sample test or kind of uh, small orders. Actually, this is, uh, can, you know, help you uh, improve that, uh, you know, efficiency. So um, that is actually, you know, pretty much the sharing I, you know, I'm going to have today. So um, it's a one word account plus two solutions. One is the e-com solution, one is, the other is actually a B2B solution. But I mean, um, I, I want to stress out as, you know, Daniel just mentioned, you know, um, we are, you know, eager to support you when you do that global business. So your voice, your pain points, yeah, you know, do matter to us. So with all this actually products, uh, say, I will say evolution, it's all based on the feedbacks we collected from our customers. So um, just to let us, you know, hear you and uh, let us know what you want. And uh, we seriously take that back and uh, put it in our product factory. And, you know, we want to bring that uh, to you and help you to grow your business. So, um, and ending, uh, my ending is actually one word account uh, for global, um, you know, for your global business, but the most importantly, for your global success and growth. And thank you. Thank you, Clara, for sharing with us about the exciting product launches and how Wolfers is helping businesses grow globally. Next, we'll be hearing about market trends, 
cross-border opportunities in Asia-Pacific. Our next speaker, Graham Doss, a partner at Deloitte in strategy, risk and transaction business. He has been based in Malaysia since 2022 and played an instrumental role in establishing the delivery center capability for Deloitte Kuala Lumpur. He was with Deloitte Africa for 15 years, where he was a partner for 12 years. He was also the Chief Operating Officer for the Risk Advisory Business for East, West and Central Africa, comprising of 13 countries. Now, would you join me as we invite Graham up to the stage? Thank you very much. So I guess I am probably a great example of global cross-border collaboration. Um, what we have here and I'll present today is research conducted largely by our China team, delivered by an African who lives in Malaysia and who flew to Singapore to deliver it. So, so what I'll do in, in taking you through this is I'll start largely at a, a macro level. There's a lot of detail here, and, and I'll try not to get too lost into that detail. But start at a macro level and then go down to some of the individual research uh, results that we got from some of the clients that we surveyed. So if, if we start at the beginning, and, and this is as macro, I guess, as you can get it, um, what, what does the trade look like? So we're very fortunate in this part of the world, and that's largely why I live here, is that these graphs go upwards. In many parts of the world at the moment, those trade graphs are going downwards. So we see both in the goods and services markets, we see increasing trends over time. And then here, being probably the most important, is looking at goods and services delivered via digital channels. So you're seeing the e-commerce market increasing, what do we see in our region? So we will see between 2021 and 2030 average growth rates intra-Asian, so intra-ASEAN, um, of 8.7%. So huge increases in average growth rates across the corridors. South Asia to ASEAN, 8.6. South Asia to Middle East, 7 and 6.3. So largely, probably best area of focus, and that's what I'm talking to you about today, is here within ASEAN, where we'll get the greatest, greatest returns, greatest growth. So RCEP, and I cannot for the life of me remember the actual name of this, but the RCEP being a regional free trade agreement between its 15 countries, which I think was eventually promulgated in 2020, but be, has been in design since 2012, but it actually represents the biggest global trade block in the world, where you have 15 countries, but 30% of the global economy represented in this trade block. And, and it has been advantageous, so certainly we're seeing advantages in terms of cost reduction and cost savings across multiple areas. So if we look at two areas, you have both at raw materials, so inputs, and at final products, we've seen savings across both. So very few where you have absolutely no cost savings, which is, is largely in the small blocks here, but you have massive savings being realized by cooperation across the region. And, and what does this mean to the value chain? So if we look at digitization um, and the digital economy, how has it impacted value chains, and, and all of you sitting here today will certainly know more about this than me, but you've seen a move away from what was the traditional model, um, which, which is largely what I've seen in a lot of the places I've worked in, to a more digital economy, which is, is democratization of services um, and, and availability to those services. So if you look in the R&D design, and I was talking to someone earlier around that who's working in this space, but 
R&D is accessibility to R&D at an SME level through open source technology. So suddenly you've got high levels of adoption and ease of access. If you look in production and manufacturing, you've seen an industrialization of the internet. You're moving now towards more smart and intelligent production, lighthouse factories, um, a, a, a matching of demand and supply, which is a challenge because what you don't want to hold in this day and age is high inventory levels. So your inventory days can be reduced considerably by the ability to match demand and supply consistently and really quickly. Um, you've got that coexistence of small and, and large scale businesses with high levels of customization and flexibility. So marketing has moved fundamentally. Marketing now almost entirely happens via digital platforms with huge online offline synergy and then the ability to, to target very precisely, to target your customers. So you are now able to gain absolute insights with a level of clarity almost down to an individual customer to target them on their specific needs. And obviously then you have the digital brand ecosystem that runs around that. Um, and lastly, after sales service, so that, that combination now of being able to operate both online and offline and, and the, the need to have synergy between those because your customer will be equally aggrieved in an online space as they will in an offline space. Um, and then largely the ability to, to have shared consumption models um, and digital delivery of the after sales service in these markets. So then, then what the team has done is, is pulled together what we've called a, a global potential index in the e-commerce space. And I'll just take you through how that's been constructed. And, and I love this graph because largely Malaysia sits at the top um, because that's where I live at the moment. But if you take this across two domains, so this index has, has been created really around a combination of, of one, market scale, so the, the actual scale of the e-commerce market, two, what does its growth potential look like? So it, it, you can see some of the metrics that we've used from GDP, GDP cap per capita, foreign direct investment, import and export volumes, and on the other side, total import exports from China, looking at digital payment, the transaction scale, um, and then looking at growth rates in e-commerce, internet penetration rates, and then largely a percentage GDP growth rate in each of these. So the green there really, I guess, represents high potential markets. So this is where you have scale, but very high growth potential. And, and, and standing here in front of an audience of, of largely Singaporeans, um, not, not to be lost, this is a stable and very mature market, but what you want to be doing really is operating from here to here to maximize your returns. So we divided it into the, the, the four areas, so high potential, mature, early stage, and then batting markets, and I'll, I'll just get into some detail on that. So, so here you see it really on a spectrum, um, your high potential markets which have established scale but are experiencing significant growth in the sector. So to my earlier point, this is where you want to be trading. This is where you'll get your highest returns. Stable, where you've got established and very high scale industries, um, but relatively mature markets which will show lower growth over time. And then the smaller scale with limited growth at the moment, maybe markets of the future, and then these are growing rapidly, but haven't achieved scale yet. So let's just drop into some of the, the countries, and, and we'll start off with Singapore. Obviously, Singapore representing, in, in, in my view, largely the center of Southeast Asia, where everything emanates from. So it, it, it's... I guess a federated structure around it, but at the center you have a trading hub that's established as a trading hub, which has spent a lot of time investing in, in the digital trade system and trying to lower trade barriers. You've seen the advantage, this is, as I say, a headquarters economy, um, and it's adjusted itself well, and, and you've heard today how quickly it's adjusted itself to diverse payment policies and processes to, to reduce 
to, or to increase the trade opportunities and competitiveness across this region. And you'll see it's still looking to experience significant growth in the period 2022 to 2028. You'll see more than 11% growth in this sector. So Malaysia, it's become a, a greater player in the uh, digital economy. It's a significant driver of that economy. It, it, it's a massive portion of it. Um, the digital delivery systems are improving, and, and we spoke about this a little bit earlier. I think what you had during COVID was it was a, a forced change to e-commerce solutions within countries. So each of the countries improved their ability to deliver services via e-commerce platforms, and now they're taking those platforms outside to other countries. So you've had a, a, a period of greater understanding of your supply chains and then your ability to take those supply chains and to externalize, externalize those into other countries. So you've had a digital free trading zone that's been established there um, to encourage specifically SME participation in digital trade. And it's expected to become the data center hub. It's also the delivery center hub. That's why we have a delivery center there. But interesting enough, I, I read, I think yesterday, that they're looking at putting a delivery center on the moon, so I'm not sure how, how big this will become at the end of the day, but a, a really important part of a central component of how you deliver digital services. And then looking at Thailand, so Thailand, you've seen a lot of the global tech giants pouring in, um, which is, is enhancing the maturity of the market. You've seen the Thai government invest a lot to create an environment where you can encourage digital innovation. And then the application of these technologies, so empowering cross-border commerce across, um, across Thailand. And then last but not least, Vietnam. And, and you spoke a little bit about Vietnam and, and the incredible growth that you're seeing there. And we've got percentages here, but if you look at the e-commerce revenue growth rate, I mean, I was fascinated to see that. If you look between 2022 and 2023, a 25% growth rate. So in four years, effectively, you'll double the size of this market. So a lot of focus from certainly the Vietnamese government in trying to drive this as an area of growth. They certainly position themselves as a future leader across Southeast Asia. You've got policy enhancements in the region. Um, the cross-border e-commerce management mechanisms are, are becoming the increasingly complete. Um, and then your logistics and, and, and back-end services are all improving along the way as you develop this commerce environment. So, so that's, I guess, at a country level and, and at a macro level across the region. It, it's dropped down a little bit into actual responses from a survey that we conducted. So it's got 270 respondents, and these were all companies operating in the e-commerce frame, so operating as digital trade companies. So, so what did they say? Let's let start at the beginning. So optimism around specifically the e-commerce industry in the coming year. So we have, and, and it's largely this green component here, but we have more than 50% of respondents very optimistic around the future development. Where will that growth come from? So I think it's growth predominantly from branding, so brand identification, and then capturing emerging opportunities. So specifically based on consumer demand, um, and then channel enhancement, so a diversification of channels, and you, you've seen some of the, the channels available in this space, and you will continue to see involvement of those channels and adoption of those. On the other side, and I, I tend to live in the risk space, so I'm always on the side of managing risk. The, the, the pessimism, I guess, here comes from what? It comes largely from facing huge competition. There is a competitive market out there. And then the second component, which is regulatory compliance. And you'll see that come out in a lot of the research, a focus both on growth, but the challenge with managing the compliance side of this. And I guess that's where 
a, a lot of this, the ability to outsource some of that compliance is hugely advantageous. So here we go to, to brand. I mean, you've got basically 88% of companies believing that brand identification, developing their own brand, absolutely critical in this space. And that, that brand is really the red line that, that follows your organization right the way through what you do. So you see that more than 68% of companies will increase their investment in branding. And the reasons for that, it's a number of reasons, but they expect that brand to give them competitive advantage on the one hand, and that in turn to drive sales growth. And in, in developing that brand, as part of developing brand identity, establishing your own independent website. So, so this has changed dramatically over time. But I, I was fascinated by this, that there are still 14% of companies that say they won't develop their own independent, um, independent website. But the bulk of them, 86% saying they either have or they are going to develop their own independent website as a mechanism to engage with customers. And then you've seen an, a greater focus. So where in the past you've probably had more focus on as many platforms as possible, you're now seeing it shift to focusing rather on a few distinct platforms. And then here you'll see a greater focus on a few or core markets as opposed to a multi-market, multi-regional strategy. So a little bit more focus in effort to very specific platforms and very specific regions. Sorry, and there's a lot of information on these. It's hard to get through all of it, but what have we seen in the technology side? So digital technologies that have been applied, we're seeing the bulk of that being in big data, and leveraging big data, combined with AI, and then uh, the Internet of Things and a couple of others. But what does this give you in how is it applied? So basically, top being leveraging that big data for data analytics. Um, what does that give you? It gives you personalized marketing. It aids you in your logistics and delivery. And ultimately, your ability to, to gain customer insights and then to do largely precision marketing right down to the customer. And then the second half of this, and this is the compliance side that we spoke about earlier, and to what Clara spoke about in terms of the, um, the security side of things, is it, it's, there's a big component of this that relies obviously on data privacy and data security. And you're seeing higher adoption rates of technologies to support you in this process. It's, it's not a, a nice to have, it's absolutely a must have in this environment. So if we look at, at the next components of this, is you're starting to see more and more localization of operations. So cross-border but localization. And 95% of respondents said that they would either maintain or increase their investment in the localization of operations across the region. And, and what's the reason for that? So one, compliance, and we spoke about this a little bit earlier, compliance requires you often to have operations in country. Um, your ability to be able to reach and service local markets. And then often it's the requirements of online platforms. You have rules that require you to localize some components of it. Um, you do want to greater reach in terms of platform traffic, you're able to get greater insights into your local customers, and then lastly, it's, I guess, reducing your operation costs. And that's one of the reasons why we have a delivery center in KL. It's cheaper for our clients to operate their services in a DC sitting in another environment. So what do we see in, in terms of issues faced during localization? Um, interesting, and these are some of the things that, that you actually touched on earlier. Compliance is the one, and it's less, I guess, about compliance for you, but funding and finance support, 
sometimes language, and then financial process issues, being payments and collections. So you see the overlap in terms of being able to provide these services absolutely critical in the challenges that you are facing and that the, the survey respondents are facing. What are the most common compliance issues? And, and this is interesting to some extent, but the first being IP compliance. Um, so patents, trademarks, the likes. The second being tax compliance, then trade compliance in, in your licensing, import, export, some of the logistics services. Customs, always an issue. And then data privacy and security hasn't been lost, but still remains. So the, the, we, we looked at the services that um, the respondents were wanting to procure, and it, it's largely in two areas. And, the first being legal services. So legal consulting services because of the laws and regulations and being able to operate in cross-border environments. And the second being cross-border payment services. So the two greatest demands across both consulting and financial. So I'll just try and summarize. It, it's, as I said at the beginning, a lot to get through, um, just give you some sense of, of, of what we're seeing. So if you start at the digital technologies, what are we seeing? So technologies are expanding across a broader set of, of payment services. So it's not just access, it's now payment plus other financial services. And then moving to the extreme, which is a more panoramic set of services that are provided across the board. We're seeing the use of AI, so AI really in sales. Um, driving product selection, driving customer service response processes, machine learning, learning to optimize your inventory distribution, which is what I was saying to you earlier, so the, not having to hold large volumes of inventory, um, using AI to, to analyze and improve search engine optimization, as well as specific content marketing. And then in the software as a service, You've moved not only from front-end, so the ability to provide front-end from web creation to operation data and visualization um, and customer acquisition, but also moving then to the back-end. So back-end being both ERP and supply chain management at the back. And then you've got really the ecosystem shifting, so you've You've heard earlier a lot of policy changes. So policy changes to both support, but policy changes also to regulate. The service ecosystem shifting. So you've got the e-commerce providers now providing an array of services, including technical support, logistical support, and then the service model shifted. And you heard that earlier, the service model now shifting to either semi-delivered managed services or a full suite of end-to-end -end managed services provided as part of your e-com platform. So to localization, just to touch on that again, it's, you've seen a move from front-end operations, some back-end operations, and now actually moving into putting operational management into the local countries. So three areas, um, and, and I won't go into the details on these, but what you're seeing really is an adoption of multiple channels, but driven primarily by independent websites at the front end. So this, this combination of we're pla using platform, but with independent website will become more and more prevalent over time. Um, brand building, so exploring the creation of high-value brands and high-value items supplied as part of those brands. Customers are stickier with high-value branded items. And then refined operations, so ultimately optimization of, of both product and the way in which you market that product and the way in which you get that product to market. And then and back to compliance, really, you've seen, obviously, a plethora of legislation that's been released across the region that impacts us all on specifically the way in which you treat your customers 
as well as the security and privacy of their data. So Indonesia, this in fact is not a bill anymore, it's actually been enacted into law. But it, it makes it challenging often to operate in the Indonesian environment because you can't externalize customer data. So we've had to, in our own world, had to develop clever strategies to be able to get around, not get around it, but to be able to have localized teams and localized data, specifically in Indonesia and Vietnam where it's more challenging. The other economies are, are adopting, I guess, a, a, a more pragmatic approach to this, but something you absolutely need to be aware of. So how do you deal with this? It, it's understanding the markets that you operate in, understanding the legislation in those markets, the ability to change as you go along because each one is different and will represent different challenges. It's about collaborating. Um, interestingly enough, I, I dealt with the cybersecurity team out of South Africa for many years. They've relocated themselves into Vietnam. So you now have partners specifically in the cybersecurity space coming in to support emerging markets because of the massive growth in those regions. And then lastly, it's about obviously training training your teams in the critical areas here, largely around breach response, because in our world we, we say it's not a question of whether, it's a question of when. And then lastly, it, it, it's really in terms of the compliance constraints, you, you do have some constraints being imposed both at an international level and then at an organizational level. Um, the, the way we see this is the e-commerce platforms are there to create the framework. So they often set that framework and the parameters of that framework because they are closer to what's happening in each of these, these markets and in each of these countries. So it's about the sellers really adhering to this, the rules created at a platform level and the ability to leverage the e-commerce platforms that have done a lot of that work already. Um, but then it's also incumbent on, on you as customers of the e-commerce platforms to, to be clearly aware of what those rules are um, and to avoid things like you know, misleading descriptions or product infringement and counterfeiting. So sorry, that was a, a lot to consume in a, a short space of time. Um, this report will be, will be made of more detail. It's a 70-page report with all of these details in it. But that's just at a high level to give you some sense of some of the research that we're seeing in the market, in the e-commerce world. It's an exceptional time to be in this part of the world and an exceptional time to be at, at the start of huge growth in this industry. So thank you very much. I appreciate you listening to me. Thank you, Graham, for sharing with us the opportunities and optimization strategies for cross-border trade. Right now, we are moving on to another segment of our panel discussion. So we've heard about the studies, and now we we'll hear from entrepreneurs who took their business beyond our borders. What are the real struggles and triumphs of going out to a new market? Allow me to introduce our moderator for today's panel discussion. Regino, who is a serial field entrepreneur that is still cracking at it. He founded the Financial Coconut, also known as TFC, Singapore's first finance podcast on his dining table in 2019. TFC has grown to become an important voice in the finance space with millions of downloads and views across TikTok, Instagram, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. May I now invite Regino with our three panelists up on stage, please. Thank you, thank you. Awesome, awesome, thank you, thank you. 
Okay, so this whole thing will be recorded into the podcast. So if you have no violent objections, right, you silently agree to being recorded, huh? Okay. <laughs> yes, and which also means after the end of the day, if you want to recap whatever that is discussed today, you can go to the Financial Coconut, nah. Okay, right. So YouTube, Spotify, your favorite podcast platform. Okay. Um, so for all panels in person, I think um, a lot of people that participate will like to ask questions. Right? Uh, if not, then you just listen to a podcast. Lah, right? So you want to ask your questions, I'll give you a bit of airtime at the end. So if you have any like, burning questions, uh, closer to the last 10 minutes, uh, we'll probably push a mic around and then you can ask your questions. Okay, if not, i got a lot of questions. Lah. Don't worry. So yeah, my name is Reggie. I started the Financial Coconut Podcast. Today we are at Wolfers event. Uh, more importantly, I think for the audience to get to know all of you before we can start the panel of like why you expand your business abroad, right? Is Singapore too small a market, right? <laughs> Clara very nicely said it's a hub. La. Hub means there's not a lot of business here, right? <laughs> Must go further, right? So, <laughs> so yes, maybe you want to, uh, you know, walk us through, introduce yourself for our, for our listeners. Uh, hi, my name is Ivan. Uh, we own a baby and maternity brand and our business uh, primarily is in the western part of the world, the US, Canada, Australia and the Europe. Yeah, so no Singapore presence. <laughs> <laughs> how, 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 just before the rest, uh, how did a, a man like you start a mother maternity? Oh, I, I started this with my wife. Oh. So when we had our first child, then my wife was passionate about uh, baby products. And I'm passionate about e-commerce, digital marketing. So we said, why not we combine power and then we start an e-commerce business. Mm. So that's how we started. Not yeah, easy. Yeah. Ago. Do with wife, not easy. <laughs> <laughs> that's another podcast. Okay? That's for another day. Yes, yes. Sean, introduce yourself. Uh, hi. Hi, everyone. My name is Sean. I'm the founder of Dreamco. We're one of the leading um, uh, PC manufacturers in Singapore, a local brand. Um, we also serve the B2B market uh, as well as the enterprise space in the, the AI, AI data, data center. Uh, we are predominantly in Singapore, unlike Ivan. Um, we have tried to Expand overseas, but we'll go into that uh, yeah, sometime. Yeah. So today you are the failed case example. Yeah, the failed case. <laughs> so now he got a lot of lessons to share. Okay, so that's later. And yes, Ho Feng. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Ho. I'm the co-founder and a sales director from uh, Verse Design. So for those of you who do not know about us, is uh, we are Shopify Plus uh, agency partners. We focus on two things. And uh, we build high conversion Shopify e-commerce websites and uh, we drive uh, clicks to convert to customers. And uh, we are HQ in Singapore, and now we have expanded our footprints to uh, about six different countries and regions. Awesome, awesome. So maybe just to kind of get the ball rolling, right? What made you started looking at expanding beyond your home market? So you have a slightly different story because your so-called home market is in the US, right? And then you expand into other parts of the Western world lah, in that sense, right? So, um, but all that being said, regardless of where's your home market, uh, it's not every day you wake up and say, I'm going to expand abroad, right? <laughs> there are a lot of problems that comes along with it as much as there are opportunities. So like what made you guys think of like, okay, I'm going to expand? Yeah, beyond where I'm already comfortable in. Anybody, want to go? Anybody can start. Uh, don't need to too cordial, right? Yes, yes. Just, just go with it. Okay, uh, the field case will go first, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, um, like what Graham mentioned earlier, um, I think operating a business in Singapore is great for uh, HQ, right? It's very easy to start your business. You know, you can effectively, as a Singaporean, uh, register your business in like 30 minutes on Accra and then get a, get a bank account running because, you know, Singapore is so small, you use a local bank, they all trust you. Um, but the problem in Singapore is that you don't have scale, uh, especially in a low-margin business, uh, for, for, the, for example, PCs. You definitely need scale. And this is what Singapore can't offer you. And as what Graham mentioned earlier as well, in Singapore, you have very fierce competition in a very commoditized product. So how do you actually stand out? Um, do you want to stay in Singapore and fight this battle of you know, expending more money in SEO, SEM marketing just to win over that little bit of market share for the little bit of margin? Or do you want to go into a different market like Vietnam, Thailand, uh, Cambodia even? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's one of the main reasons why we had to expand overseas. Yeah, but you are the dominant player in your vertical already. Yeah. It's between you and Aftershock, right? pretty much the two of you. Right? So, but then when you try to expand into another market, from what I know about your story is you didn't use your main product line. Right? So what's the top process? Um, yeah, so I spoke to Reginald um, yesterday and, and basically when we wanted to expand, we're in the business of custom PC space. 
but we also manufacture everything from our own keyboards and mice uh, from China or Taiwan, as well as uh, monitors. And this is effectively to compete with you know, your incumbent brands like LG, Samsung, and all these guys. Um, so we do have a price advantage, um, but to bring our main core, uh, dream core PC brand overseas, it requires a huge capex investment. You need the team, you need the warehouse, the production facility, the service center, and you need a huge uh, marketing plan uh, to back it up. And when you enter a market, I think when, you are, you know, when you're starting from zero as a zero dollar entrepreneur, it's easy to say, okay, let's take the first step. You know, we burn some cash and we see how, uh, where this goes. But once you are you know, in the middle of the journey, I think it's very difficult to say, okay, let's just plonk down you know, uh, $2 million and then we're just gonna go into expanding another market. So what we did was we, we saw this novel solution where we would just enter with a different product line under our Dreamcore brand, but in a more D2C fashion. So we actually launched monitors in Malaysia. Um, and when we did that, basically it's drop shipping effectively. I don't need a service center. It's very, very 3PL heavy. Um, and it's what you know, Clara mentioned earlier, you know, just buy the products, manufacture from overseas, ship them in, you have your 3PL handle the last mile, and, and that's really it. And you can focus on your SEO, SEM game. Mm. You don't have to worry too much about the cost of setting up an entire operation. Yeah. So that sounded like a plan, right? But it didn't work out, right? So, so what, what, what happened? Give, give us a little bit more. Hey, there are three guys. It's okay, it's okay. Yeah. The story will develop one. Don't worry, huh? Yes, 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 yeah. The yeah. juicy parts need to come, yes. Um, so, so it wasn't really... Uh, I mean, everything is down to our fault, yeah, basically. But... Ultimately, during COVID, everyone in the tech space did well. Work from home PCs, uh, productivity setups, standing desks, chairs, everything did well. I think this was when manufacturing ramped up globally in China and Taiwan. <clears throat> and post-COVID, we obviously saw a slump. And when the slump happened, everybody had massive inventory to clear. So again, back to what Graham said earlier, now everyone's on lean inventory to survive. Um, and when that happened, when everyone had too much inventory to clear, what happens? The price all dropped. So even though we launched a very good product in the Malaysian market as our first touch point, um, by then the incumbents had tons of inventory to clear. And do you want to buy uh, you know, a monitor from an up-and-coming brand like Dreamcore, or do you want to buy uh, LG and Samsung at the same price? I think that's kind of where, uh, where we were at, and we had to make the painful decision to, to pull back. Okay, okay, fair. We will develop the story. Yeah? But in Ivan, I think you also have quite an interesting story around here. So you are essentially what they call the 3PL, right? You, you kind of bring in a brand and then you, 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 you kind of go down that path, direct consumer, right? So how is your business like? You know, why do you choose to start in the US and all that jazz? Uh, so 2017, uh, when we started, I think e-commerce and uh, model was very popular. So that everybody was talking about e-commerce and uptrend. Yeah, it's all over my YouTube channel. <laughs> so yeah, and then like, uh, and then there was we were introduced by to this program by Amazon called the FBA program, fulfilled by Amazon program, whereby whereby they you shoot the inventory to them, and then they will do the last mile fulfillment for you, and then they have a platform whereby you can reach out to their customers and sell your products to them. So naively we're thinking like, starting in Singapore and starting in the US, I think both also very hard. So and, and since both were very hard and uh, US is such a big market, so why not we choose the big market? Mm. And uh, then naively, that's how we decided to start in the US. And then like, it's been seven years since then. Okay, Ho Feng, is that, is that true? If both markets are equally hard, might as well start in the US? Because you work with a lot of clients. So is that, is that a fallacy or is that accurate? I think it very much depends on how much bullet you have. Okay. You want to elaborate a little bit more? What does that mean? Yeah, US is a, a rather big market. I think the setting up everything is a lot of uh, good potentials, but also I think the competition is also rather high. And then in terms of uh, driving traffic, driving, uh, you know, running your marketing campaigns and all this, it's going to be next level compared to Singapore or Southeast Asia countries. Okay. Can you give us a bit more tangible? What does next level look like? Uh, for example, right, we just use uh, SEO as a point of view. You know, in Google USA and Google Singapore, um, both we only have 10 positions on Google first page. Can you imagine <laughs> how many players that are in the state compared to in Singapore? Yeah, that's the next level of competitions. Mm, okay. 
Okay, fair. And, but you have kind of facilitated quite a lot of expansion for some of the local brands, you know, into the region. And they had some problems along the way, you know, something about systems and all that jazz. You want to share with our audience? Yeah, yeah. Um, we have one of the merchants who actually um, running the e-commerce cross-border business for over, I think, 10 over years. I will be able to share a little bit more on these uh, case studies uh, later on during my own workshop. So you can... Uh, <laughs> he plugged his uh, workshop uh, <laughs> outside, okay? Yeah. So he's expecting to, all the crowd to go yeah, there. Huh? Start to promote already. <laughs> yeah. So for these merchants, um, uh, proud to migrating to Shopify Plus, I think they are running a gentle uh, system, which is a very heavy, very hard to customize uh, system. They face a lot of challenges. I still remember one of the things that, and then me and my team, um, we always have to stand by 20, uh, 2359, midnight. And then the reason is because they, every week they blast out about three, minimum three to four emails, and then, then to their about 50 to 100K um, database. And then when they blast out the email, and then guess what happened? Everybody will go and click their EDM and then come to their website. And because uh, for every of their new collections is a limited quantity. So you don't get it, that means you're going to wait for the next uh, collections. So what happens is every time we see the website slow down, until the stage is unresponsive, and then you can't open it. So we have to quickly get our teams and then get our crews to go in and then do something and then to bring it back. And then that was the challenge, actually, for, for, for many of the merchants, I believe. They are not the only one. So the, the answer is to port over, use another system. Yes, the answer is you really need to find a good platform which actually allows you to scale up, especially during your festival, your peak sales, uh, sales period. Mm. And then you do not need to worry about you pump in so much money for your marketing, you drive quality clicks to the site, but then only realize and then it can't convert. So if you feel at the last step, and then everything will not work. Okay, so later go for his workshop, lah. Okay, yeah. outside you you hear more. Yes. I'd like to add on to yes. uh, to what uh, Ho Feng, Ho Feng. Ho Feng said. Uh, so basically, because like when you, when you want to expand overseas, uh, doing a D to C model, you have to spend a lot of money on marketing, uh, acquiring customers. You have to do SEO, SEM. All these are a lot of money. So that's why for us, when we started, we we leverage on uh, an e-commerce platform and we go through the. Uh, marketplace uh, e-commerce platform route whereby there's really ready customers. Uh, we just need to figure out how do we get our products in front of these uh, ready customers and then making sure our product listing is good, our photography is good, reviews are good and that's where we actually uh, expanded. So actually for us, we didn't burn a lot of money in the US. Uh, in fact, in the first year, we were really profitable. Uh, yeah, and... and End of story. That, that's how good <laughs> yeah, we're very lucky we made it profitable. <laughs> so, but do you expand beyond a uh, marketplace platform after that? Or you're still doing the marketplaces only? A big part of our business is still on the marketplace. Like we, we establish ourselves as a marketplace brand rather than a Shopify D2C brand running fa fancy full Facebook ads. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That one very loaded, huh? fancy full Facebook ads. <laughs> that, that's, that, that's for later, yes. But actually, I wanted to dig a little bit deeper to what Sean said just now. When you are a $0 entrepreneur, everything also do. Right? And, but you, you grind it out, two, three years in, you find a product market fit, you have a home base, you've got a business already. Right? And now when you try to enter into another market, you're not going to do another three years. Right? Right? You want to go in six months, give me something. Right, so so with that thought process, entering a new market, you also expanded into a new market, not just in the US anymore, right? So, what were the earlier challenges once you entered in? After all your market study, everything looked very sweet, one, right? But once you went in, what are some of the common challenges that you you didn't, you know, kind of prepare for? Yeah, anybody can can take it up. Uh, so for us, we were in US for about three years, and then we expanded to Canada, Australia, and Europe. I think so for us, it was a natural progression because we, we just follow Amazon's footprint. So whenever they have a presence in, they are the number one e-commerce platform there, and then we just follow. Uh. So for us, it was a very natural progression to just uh, expand to, to the other countries and make it very easy for you. With one click, you can have your product listings on all the marketplace. Then you've got to figure out the compliance in that country, the regulation, the tax, and all the, all the legal stuff. Uh. Yeah. And then WordPress is very supportive. They have all these uh, multi-currencies. 
that we can use to like straight away receive money in Canadian dollars, in Euro dollars, in Australian dollars. Yeah, so we are using World First since day one. Okay, very smooth plug. <laughs> uh, I don't need to plug already. <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> good stuff, good stuff. And Sean, what about you? you? Your story is quite interesting on this. I mean, we haven't really... Hired a whole bunch. Yeah, we haven't really operated in a foreign country for a very long time, but um, I think one of the bigger challenges that we face has always been uh, manpower. I think whether it's, it's foreign or local, um, hiring the right people as well as the right partners to manage the business, I think that is, I think, one of the make or breaks. Uh, anything else you can sort of recover from, but if you don't have a strong foundational team uh, that is aligned to your vision, um, then it's very, very difficult to grow uh, anywhere. So I think a lot of successful companies, um, you know, in our vertical or uh, elsewhere, instead of going over and saying, you know, I'm, I'm the hero, I'm from Singapore, I'm going to, you know, change the, the landscape and all that by myself, you should actually look for a partner that understands the, the, the local background much more than you. And you can never understand it. Right? So is this a retrospective thought process? Yes, definitely. Okay, okay. Please, please continue. Yeah. Yeah. So, and without that partner, I think it, you're kind of just wasting a lot of time, wasting a lot of resources on trying to to you know bash through the market. Unless, unless you have something that is so unique, you have this moat around it, like a, almost like a patent that everybody wants. Then yeah, it doesn't really matter because it comes from you. Um, but if you're trying to expand a, a commoditized product into a different uh, location. I think that's super important. So one of the kind of workarounds that we, we tried to fix our ex, um, overseas expansion was to instead sell directly to local companies and that has been working out for us uh, very, very well. So instead of having a service center there, we actually sell to Brunei, uh, Taiwan, uh, Philippines and all these countries directly to the end users instead. Yeah. Okay, so this is after you've already tried it, you realize that it's too hard to operate. Let's just work with a local partner. Uh, not that it's too hard. I think we haven't found the right partner to go in with. So once that is secure, I think that will definitely go again. Okay, fair. And Ho Feng, is this uh, the consensus among some of your partners? Yes, we've, uh, from the agency point of view and uh, my own observations, uh, this is quite true. I think for overseas expansions, uh, we've seen a lot of, uh, but they, they are slightly different demographics that we have seen. Some of the, our uh, e-commerce merchants, they were originated, maybe uh, like their background is traditional retailers. So from retailer, they go online. And then from online, then they expand to overseas. So we've seen a trend that is that for these kind of traditional retailers, they tend to start their uh, brick and mortar shops in overseas. Really? Yeah. Isn't Rather that very high capex? It is, it is. But this is what they are good at. And then I believe their success rate, right, is kind of higher for them to go with the traditional wave to expand. So we've seen some of the players and actually the merchants, they, they do this. And then, um, but we also see other um, pure e-commerce um, uh, players. And then what they do is they, they will test new market first, like what uh, Sean has mentioned, and then directly open up markets to those like uh, countries with a similar, let's say, demographies, a similar customer base. And then they test it out before they fully go in and enter to that market to set up their own localized warehouse, their own, own localized operation teams, and then to do a full, uh, we call it a country expansion. Yeah, fair. I mean, that, that's why Singapore and Malaysia is, is so interesting, right? Because it's one cultural circle, everybody's pretty similar, desires are similar, right? But once you enter, you know, Philippines, Vietnam, Thailand, all look very sexy, but culturally very different, right? So that's a different way to run in, in that space. But you were talking about testing, right? So I think a lot of people, they, they want to test. It's all for risk management, right? Like, you already have a business, you want to expand, but you want to test, right? So what are some of the best-in-class methods to test a new market? How would you all do it? Okay, if um, you are uh, already a short five merchants, it's a lot easy. You just need to tap on the latest uh, edition of uh, Shopify Markets, which um, one of our merchants, um, they made, uh, enter into a new market, they made this decision, and then they made it in less than 24 hours. And then if you are not a Shopify... Wait, can you elaborate a little bit? How do you do it in 24 hours? Oh, this part, actually, Shopify Markets allows the merchants to 
DIY, and then you are able to actually um, enter and enable uh, foreign markets just by localize the currency, localize the language, localize probably the payment gateways, and then you are ready to go in for the first step. And uh, we noticed that for some other platforms, which entering into a new market is uh, rather costly and uh, takes a lot of uh, time. The time to market is much longer. So for that one, there's a great opportunity loss if um, the platform is not that user-friendly to support you for this. Mm. So the translation is accurate? <laughs> um, not 100%. Oh, yeah. But um, the, the, the interesting part is, after you use some of the, let's say, the Shopify apps, the adapt to translate, uh, to adapt app, right? Then after that, it allows you to manually edit those uh, translated contents. So it depends on whether you are okay with the, we call it a machine translator, or you still can do actually a little bit of the edits, uh, post edits after that. Okay, okay, fair. What about you guys? How, how would you test a new market today? Uh, I mean, it's pretty standard, I think you normally go down the, the data route, right? So you, you check whatever you can check with your SEO, SEM tools in the local country or the country you're targeting. You know what kind of keywords are, are hot and popular based on your industry. Then you obviously go down and talk to other business owners, uh, network a little bit, see who you can um, help you on your journey in, in, the, <clears throat> in the new region. Then the third one is to commission a study, right? And Sometimes it may be costly depending on who you use. Um, you can go all the way to like BCG if you want uh, to commission a study on the entire landscape and tell you, you know, what are the focus markets, what are focus products, as well as what are the uh, pros and cons of the current competitors. And then that's, that's when you can go in. Mm. Yeah, so it's, it's, to me, it's pretty standard. If you don't have a lot of budget, you just do the, the, your own data scraping route. If you do have money, then you can go the consultancy route and get the data quickly. Mm. Okay, fair. Ivan, other than just follow Amazon? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think now with uh, the internet, it's so easy to get like data, and especially Amazon again. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a platform whereby you can, you can get a lot of customer data and, and the demand of a particular product in that market. So by using some uh, school's tools to to analyze, you can easily know this particular product is ours, what's the demand in that country, and uh, what are the customer feedback of that product in that country, and you, whether you feel there's a market fit. So if it's fit, then you just, uh, you just ship out a couple, like a small amount of inventory there, and just to test out the market and see what's the take up rate and see if people buy. And then if people buy, then we just go all in. Yeah. Since we already name drop, like no tomorrow, right? There are a lot of brands that are being name drop. What are some of the tools that you use then? Oh, we use Amazon, Amazon tools. tools <laughs> like. Amazon software tools. But if you talk about SEM, there's like SEMrush. Yeah, but mainly we use Amazon tools to analyze Amazon data and Amazon customers' feedback and everything. Mm, okay, okay. So the, the baseline thought these days, right, is a lot of the other things have been pretty much solved by business solution suites. Right? Like, like we'll first solve your currency struggles. You got last mile delivery platform, you got e-commerce back-end platforms. So they, they pretty much vertically integrate a lot of the struggles that a business owner have, especially expanding abroad, right? So the thought process is, since they already do everything, then all you need to focus on is branding and marketing, right? That's, that's the narrative. Is this true? Is that a fair statement, you know? Or are there other struggles in that process that you realize, hey, it's not so simple, huh? There are other things. Anyone take a jab? All right, let me take this. I think from the agency point of view, um, it's not that easy. The reason is because I think you need to solve the fundamental thing, which is your product market fit and your product USP first. And then this is the fundamental one. Without this one, everything else will not be valid. And then the second part is, uh, um, yes, um, marketing is important driving traffic, driving clicks and all this. But in the actual reality is that um, the, the average number that we have gotten from a Shopify official is that uh, for cross-border e-commerce, the average conversion rate is at about 1.88%, slightly below 2%. So what happened to the 98% of them when they land on your website, but then they leave 
actually plays an important part. So this is, I think, for every e-commerce merchant to, to think and to consider um, how you attract 98% of them. Uh, some of the strategy could be like you try to get them to leave uh, probably their emails and then subscribe to your leads or subscribe to certain incentives. And then so that you can have, you can form some sort of uh, uh, Establish some sort of uh, touch points and connections with them, and then your marketing automations can come into the play because driving uh, marketing uh, traffic like um, a paid search, paid socials, is become a lot more expensive than uh, before. So, how to retain them is actually a, 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 a big question for all the e-commerce uh, e merchants to consider. Okay, what, what about you guys? Actual experience. I'm a bit like opposite of uh, <laughs> of him because it says Shopify conversions are one percent, which is true. Because on our website, it's also like one point something percent. But when we do when we do e-commerce, there are already buyers. Our conversion is like ten to fifteen percent. So, I mean, the difference is a uh, is a uh, is a lot of difference. So it's easier to get people to buy from you because they are already looking for certain products. Um, so if like like what he said, the uh, payments are all integrated, the logistics are all integrated. So initially when we began, when we started, it was really about just branding and marketing that we were, and also product quality, of course. And uh, the issue now is how do we get people to buy and how do we stand out from our competitors mm. on the marketplace? So we were just really focusing on that for the first two to three, uh, first one to two years and really just trying to figure out uh, how do we stand out from competitors? How do we get good cust uh, product reviews? How do we get customers to buy from us? And uh, yeah, so okay. So then, what are some of the strategies to stand out from your competitors that you've tried that works? I think on the marketplace, uh, with no branding as a new brand, you nobody knows who you are. I think then your pricing strategy is number one. Of course, number two is your be your pricing strategy is a sophisticated way of saying cheap, lah. Is it? <laughs> Must price out your competitor. But is that uh, the idea? No, no, no. Maybe he's giving more value uh, at the same price yeah, point. Yeah, more value. Okay. How do you improve the product quality? Mm. Um, and also customer review. It's very important on the uh, all the e-commerce platform. So we do what we can as much as possible to get as many five-star reviews as we can. And then over time, it builds up. Look. And then once we have like a sizable number of reviews, then your we call it we, we, it's kind of like a mode compared. So if like ten thousand reviews for a product compared to someone who has five reviews, then like ten thousand reviews becomes a, a mode for you. Yeah. yeah, I mean from a consumer standpoint, it's true right? If the pricing is similar, the one with higher review, I'll just take it, right? So so that's a fair point. Yeah. What well, what about you guys? So so, so I think what both of them uh, covered is absolutely correct. Even though it may seem like there's only marketing and branding left. Ultimately, it's still the product fit and how well received your product is. Um, and that's also kind of one of the challenges that we face because our, we don't really have a mode except that we have started earlier, we have better service, you know, our products are great. Um, but tomorrow, any of you can say, hey, I'm, I'm going to start a PC, custom PC company because you just put 10 pieces of components together, right? Like anyone can do it, right? technically. Right, so, so ultimately, you need to build that mode. And I think every entrepreneur goes through that same um, path. First, you kind of find a product that you want to do, maybe passion or not. You market, market the shit out of it. Get it to some scale. Then I think that's where Ivan is now, when he has that scale. What's next? If you continue in this marketing and branding thing, it may not move the needle much because you're already there. So what's going to happen next is that you have to innovate on your products. Right, you need to say, we have used, uh, specifically baby products, uh, let's say we have used, uh, we work with A-Star or something to develop something that is like lighter than bamboo fabric, something like that. I love how A-Star is in baby products. But they do, they do. Just yeah, yeah, they, they, yeah, they, they do, do everything, right? <laughs> yeah, right? yeah so, they want to land it in the market. So then you, you, you have IP now, mm. and it becomes an IP play. No one else can touch your IP. Mm. I think that is the next step. I mean, I'm not saying that should be your next step. <laughs> <laughs> that, you that's what I would do. Already. Yeah. Okay, okay, fair. So, uh, I think that they've answered a lot of good stuff, right? And uh, I would like to kind of open up the floor. Anybody has specific questions for the panel? You know, uh, can 
raise of hand, we will pass the mic over to you. You know, because you're already here, you want specific questions answered. Anybody? Somebody at the back? I'm sorry. Okay, yes, one question here. Oh, one more at the back. Okay, yes, come. Um, thank you, speakers, for three gentlemen for sharing your thoughts. Uh, I'm Percy. We work with a lot of uh, D2C brands, and would love to pick your brain on, you know, when you go through the journey from zero to one, scaling up, uh, becoming, you know, um, the industry leader in your field, right? How do you, um, you know, do, do you do all this growth initiative locally and cross-border? Uh, do you fund them with your own balance sheet, or do you leverage on, you know, bank loans, private credit, or equity investor through different journeys? Thank you. Good question. And he, he everything Amazon, he don't need to fund. <laughs> so, so, anyone, anyone else got something? Okay, so we, we haven't really raised um, money from uh, uh, institutions, so it's primarily uh, friends and family, uh, and of course my, my, my own cash. Um, so everything is funded through the company. So yes, technically, whether it's through loans, whether it's through um, funds raised, everything is funded through uh, the balance sheet. But we, don't, we have not gone out to a different market to, for example, partner with a local there and then get joint investment with a different company. I think that's something we haven't done yet. Is that a thought process why you, you have not explored it? I think we're at the beginning, even though we are seven years, seven, eight years in, um, I don't know, time flew really fast. I don't consider it like Entrepreneur, a long time. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so I don't think we were ready at that time to, to take that step. But I think going forward, we, we are looking uh, very aggressively outwards to see, because ultimately it's a market, um, market share game. It's a volume game for us. And without partnering up with some, uh, someone else in a different region, I think it's very, very difficult to, to stay in Singapore. Okay, so Sean just said he's open to funding round. Huh? You can email him. <laughs> Ivan, you got anything to add on that? Uh, we grew organically. We also don't have any investors or don't have any uh, loans and everything. So we are debt-free. Interestingly, when I tell people that we do not have employees in the US, do not have employees in the Europe, we have zero employees in all these countries that we're in, so people are quite surprised. And again, because of internet, everything is publicly available. So you don't really need to have, you know, like employees in the US on the ground to, to do your research for you, whereby you can easily do it in the US. I mean, on the, on the internet. So pretty much everything for us is still in Singapore, with our team here, a few virtual assistants in the Philippines. Yeah. That is very lean, huh? Yeah. Pretty cool. cool oh, oh, but, but to answer your question, we didn't specifically raise for expansion, if that's what you were asking. We didn't specifically raise or we didn't specifically take on a, a bank loan for the expansion. It's more like um, we had access to credit and then we just took on a, as much credit as we could. Uh, I think a couple of years ago, interest rates were like 0%, 0.5%. Yeah. So, um, you know, money was cheap, so we took it uh, and then we saw, okay, let's see what we can do with this. Rather than... I know it's, it's a little bit wrong, but we should have said, okay, this is the business plan. We need X amount to expand to Malaysia. This is, you know, earmarked for that. No, we didn't do that. Okay. We were just okay. like, let's go. <clears throat> go. <laughs> let's just cross. Okay, great. Um, any other questions? Thank you for the question. Okay, one more question at the back. Actually, there's two more questions at the back. Okay, I can only take three questions. Huh? Okay, we got limited time. Yeah. All the workshop. Uh, Hi, gentlemen. Pros. Thank you for your sharing. Appreciate the experience. Uh, a little bit deeper on your resource allocation part. Like when you, do you have like a percentage that you allocate aside for marketing costs or goods sold operations um, and, how, and profit margins? There is a fine balance on how much you need to spend in order to gain. So I'd like to know what are your formulas for that? That's a fair question. Confirm has his own business. <laughs> Anybody? It's how we expand. We expand uh, via product range. So more and more different kinds of baby products that we develop. Uh, so usually how we do it is we set aside like 10% of our annual profits and then we use it to develop new products. And then from then, then we will, uh, my finance manager will do like hiring budgets required to, in order to, act, to follow uh, our expansion plans, which works out to be about, I think, 
maybe 5% of our net profit due to hiring and increase uh, manpower headcount and everything. So we, we, we pre-plan uh, every year, the year ahead, what we, the budget allocated, and then we just stick to that budget. Unless something uh, very serious arises, then we need to re-look into the budget that we have set, set aside. Yeah. Do, you, do you see his energy when you say, ah, my finance manager? <laughs> that means the financial controller stopped some of his plans before. <laughs> okay, la last question, last question. I, I hope that answered your... If you got any other things to add on, on that? If not. I mean, we, we, not, we typically set aside 3% of our uh, annual revenue for marketing, but the rest of the stuff like product development and all that doesn't really, isn't too expensive for us. Um, sometimes there are opportunities that come our way and we have to break the budget. Uh, we don't have our finance manager. La. I make oh, all yeah, the decisions. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, we're, uh, Dream Call, we're opening a, a retail shop spe uh, specifically for Land Cafe. Nice. Right? And even though this sounds very passe, or maybe when you're a kid, you know, you go to these land shops and, and play games. It really ties back to our greater ecosystem of loyalty programs, membership rewards, and all these things. Um, and it becomes more of a tech SaaS play rather than just a hardware solution. Okay, yeah. okay, interesting. Any last questions? One more? I saw one more hand. Oh yeah, one more question. Over there. Yes, last one. Thank you. So, um, hi, I'm Vicky. And here today, we're talking a lot about um, growing internationally, sales and all of that. But I wonder, um, how do you manage complaints overseas? <laughs> I mean, it's bound to happen. Yeah. So yeah, it's just some curiosity. Mm. Very practical question, I like. Yeah. <laughs> how to manage complaints? Are Singaporeans the worst? <laughs> Okay, that's a, that's a different story, yes. So actually for us, uh, in every business, there is bound to be customers who are not happy with us. Uh, so for us, we have a guiding principle, which is customer obsession. Uh, so for us, every time the customer says something, they are always right. So if they want a refund, usually if it's like not unreasonable, we will just refund them. And then they make them happy. And then they... It's okay if like 1% of the customer scams us because... They are not reasonable and everything, but to us is for the long term wise, uh, refunding them this time to retain a customer to make a customer happy goes a long way uh, in the in the long term business of uh, making more and more customers happy. Mm. So it's always okay if you lose out that one or two refunds here and there. It doesn't really matter, and because our, and also because our product is not like super high end like yeah that was what I was about to say because refund one or two baby products okay yeah, uh. yeah, yeah, yeah. refund our, a few computers is a different story yeah our product <laughs> is all like three dollars <laughs> probably like two thousand yeah, dollars yeah, I don't yeah, know how he does yeah. it so maybe I know uh, he has a story there yeah he, he probably has a service center and everything yeah, we're gonna share a little bit uh, so so we used to handle okay so some of the, some of the things that that you know we are the subject matter experts in PCs right so when we handle the cases ourselves we can get through to the customer and explain very clearly what's going on. But as the, as the company grows, as our customer base grows, then we need to hire um, outside of, of um, the tech group. So we actually outsource some of our call centers to the Philippines as well to reduce some of our costs. Um, and then that creates a barrier of understanding. You know, sometimes they, we don't train them properly or their knowledge isn't great. But nonetheless, having someone that can directly speak to the customer as and when no matter what time of the day, I think that resolves most of the uh, customers' like complaints already. It's only when the customer feels unheard that is where trouble starts, and that's where you get the bad reviews and all that. Um, yeah, regarding what uh, Reginald spoke about scams, um, this year has been like record scam for us, right? <laughs> record. Um, and and the the crazy thing is that they make use of all the local 3PLs, whether it's it's uh, Lala Move. So the recent one we had, I think two of them, they basically use fraudulent credit cards. This is quite basic, love, but they buy PCs and they have the PCs shipped to uh, a 3PL facility. And then within the next day, it, it ships out to like Vietnam or Myanmar. And then four days later, the guy whose credit card got stolen, he's like, oh, this is a fraudulent request. The banks will call back the money from us and then yeah, we lose that $2,000, $3,000. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. And our margins, our GP is not as high as a FNCG product. It's maybe 15, 10 to 15%. So you're talking like you're definitely losing money on this. Yeah. Crazy, crazy. So how do you solve? I just want to find out how do you <laughs> mitigate. <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing to like solve, try to mitigate this? Uh, all these raise, raise more money. 
Yeah, can email, no, so, email to Sean at DreamCore. So, um, now we have to train the staff, right? We have to train the staff. We, we were uh, an attack of phishing as well. So, they changed the domain. So, Kim Lee was one of the construction companies that we saw, right? And then somebody just changed the domain to kim lee.sg instead of kim lee.sg, for example. And then we delivered. My guy didn't really check the domain because you kind of just trust. And then they shipped like 30,000, 40,000 worth of stuff to a 3 PL warehouse again, and then it's gone. Um, we didn't fire the guy, but you know. Uh, so, so ultimately, it's about training. Okay, check for domains, check for industrial addresses. If it's kind of local, homes, uh, normal condo, HCB address, I think that's fine. Uh, but when we see company B2B addresses, we need to take note. So that's the only thing that we can do. Uh, second part on the payment system is when you use your payment gateways, you turn on 3DS. So instead of just going through, put your, your CVV three-digit thing, you get a phone notification as well, then the transaction goes through. And usually on a stolen credit card, you won't have the 3DS. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, okay, cool. I'm interested why you never fired that guy. But that's a, that's a different story. Yes, yes. Hofeng, anything to add? Yeah, there are some of the e-commerce platforms uh, allow you to do some uh, level of uh, fraudulent uh, detections. Mm -hmm. For example, right, then they can cross-check the billing address and delivery address whether it's matched. And then, then threshold certain amount or certain value. And then, then if they do such cross-check and then, then they suspect it's a fraudulent one, they will be able to like bring up these case to you and then so that they send you a notifications. And then, then you can zoom into it and to check out those uh, details. But you still need to do your KYC and due diligence test on those uh, suspicious uh, transactions. Okay, okay. Our website where you Shopify, we actually do what, what, what he said. Like, mm. certain threshold it hits, they will send a notification to us. So, like, somebody ordered $500 of baby product, then we will get notified. That's a and big then the baby. shipment will be on hold. No wonder I'm on a WordPress. Yeah. Huh? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We can talk about that separately. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Great, great, great. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your questions. Maybe just one last thing to wrap it up. Knowing what you know today, how would you do it differently when you expand into a new market? Just to wrap up the whole thing. You, you'll be the same like Amazon. Uh. Is it? <laughs> we will still do the same. We will still do it the same way. Okay, yes, yes. I think uh, finding uh, the right partner, and not just a partner because he's a local guy that can you know, open uh, a bank account and all that. It's more like a local partner that can bring, can leverage your existing business to grow in that market. I think that's super important. Whether he brings uh, operational skills to the table or capital raising skills to the table or even uh, technology skills to the table, right? If he, for example, I get a guy like him, then everything else will be SEO, SEM, digital, uh, my website will be all done very, very well. Fair, fair. Okay, Ho Feng, last thing. Yeah, for me, I think one thing that I want to share with the uh, merchants would be uh, start your retention strategies as early as possible. Even you are newly starting up your e-commerce uh, online stores and then you are at the early uh, zero to one acquisition stage, uh, that doesn't mean that the retention uh, is not important to you. So it matters a lot. We have seen some of the data, uh, some of the successful uh, merchants, their retention, uh, especially with the marketing automations and email marketing attributed retentions, can attribute to as high as 50 to 60 percent of the GMVs. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you start earlier, then you start to accumulate all these data and at that much earlier stage, and then it will be a lot easier for you when you pass over the heavy acquisition stage to the retention phase. Okay, thank you, thank you. I, uh, can we give them a round of applause? Thank you for your time, thank you for their time. If you want to re-listen to this whole podcast, go to the Financial Coconut. Give us some time, uh, we'll edit it and we'll post it. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. I'll take a photo. Uh. Take, a photo. Uh, take photo, take photo. Yeah, yeah. Okay, there are a lot of workshops. Uh, so I'll pass it back to you, Joan. Go. Thank you, Reginald, as well as Ivan, Sean, and Ho Feng for the insightful session and real stories. Well, we settle some logistics 
and before we head off to our business workshops. It's going to be an exciting time now because I did mention about some giveaways. So we are moving on to our lucky draw segment. I hope you are excited. So fun fact, did you know that Wolf first launched its Singapore office here in 2014? Well, although Wolfers has been around since 2004, but being here in Singapore, that marks our 10th anniversary, right? So we're giving away 10 lucky draw prizes. Now, for this segment, it will be five lucky draw prizes from the 6th to the 10th winner. And I'd like to introduce the 10th prize to you. Oh yes, before that, i also like to invite Barry Leonardi, our Head of Partnerships for Southeast Asia at Wolfers, to present the prize later. All right, for our 10th prize, this is a 27-inch Prism Plus monitor. <laughs> All the best. Let's spin the wheel. And the winner is... Graham! <laughs> Graham, welcome! Up on stage, we'd like to present the prizes to you while I get it up as well. Congratulations, Graham. So close, you know, all your names, so close, our speakers. <laughs> Not to worry, we still have nine more prizes to go. Congratulations to you, Graham. While we invite Barry to remain as well, up on stage. Next up, we have our eighth and ninth prize is also a 27-inch Prism Plus monitor. All right, so now we'll go on on the ninth prize. And the winner is John, John Audio 500. Come on up. Congratulations to you, John. Next, we'll have our eighth lucky draw prize. And the winner goes to Fumuji. Is Fumuji here? Oh, yes, we have our winner. Come on up on stage. Congratulations to you, Mr. Fu, on winning a 27-inch Prism Plus monitor. Good luck, everyone. We still have two more prizes for this segment. And now I'll be announcing our sixth and seventh prize. All right? We all know how important it is to breathe in odor-free air. Right? Can you guess what prize it is? I heard the brand, Stara, and the winner will receive a Stara Moon air purifier. Okay, so for our seventh prize, drum rolls, six winner goes to Abel Ng. Is Abel Ng here?
apologies, Abel Ng. Come up to stage. Congratulations on winning Astera Air Purifier. If you notice today, most of the brands that I have mentioned so far are homegrown Singapore brands, which we strongly support. Next, we also like to do, uh, yeah, spin the wheel for the sixth winner for this session. Good luck, everyone. Congratulations to S.H. Ming. As he we come on up on stage. Congratulations. Thank you, Barry, for presenting all the prizes. For our five winners, ladies and gentlemen, not to be missed, we still have five more that will be presented later during our networking lunch. As for now, before we break out into our workshops, we'd like to take a group photo with everyone. So if I can invite all of us to stand and with our first two rows, we'd like to invite you up on stage for a group photo followed by the third, fourth and fifth row. So may I invite ladies and gentlemen, may we please rise? for a group photo before we break off. Okay. Sorry, based on phot our photographer's expertise, you know I'm not a photographer, it might be easier for us to take from here, right, to your seats. So remain comfortably where you're at, huge smiles on your faces as we take the group photo. And we'll take the count from our photographers at the front. Is everyone ready? One more thumbs up. One last photo. Already, big smiles. <laughs> <laughs> 